Welcome to Free Media. I'm Amber Duke. And I'm Robbie Suave. Well, the hosts over at CNN provided this riveting coverage of Michael Cohen's testimony against former President Donald Trump. You don't want to miss it. After you learn from Dylan Howard and from Keith Davidson about the Stormy Daniels story and are wanting to publish that story and the conversations about purchasing that story, did you speak to Mr. Trump? I did. Can you tell us, first of all, why did you speak to Mr. Trump about it? Because, <clears throat> because it was a matter that affected him and because that was what I always did, which was to keep him abreast of everything. Was this also a serious matter at that time? A very serious matter. Over on MSNBC, Lawrence O'Donnell fawned over Cohen's testimony, calling him flawless. No reason to think anything negative about Michael Cohen. His demeanor has been flawless from the prosecution's standpoint. Uh, this is a version of Michael Cohen we don't see publicly. He is uh, composed and he speaks carefully. His uh, answers are short. Uh, as short as they can be, which is what uh, the prosecutor wants from him. Uh, frequently, the answers are yes and no. There's nothing combative about it, about him. There's nothing defensive about him. Back on CNN, some of the coverage was a bit more sobering. We'll give them their props where it's due. Let's watch. But I've never seen a witness who's lied to Congress, who's lied in court, who's lied to the IRS, who's lied to the Southern District of New York, who lied to his banker. Uh, you know, the entire prosecution witness team has been lied to. Flawless on one hand, but also admitted, confessed, repeatedly proven liar on the other. What did you make of the testimony so far? Oh boy. I mean, I, I think the fundamental problem with the prosecution is that because they decided to elevate this from a misdemeanor to a felony, they not only have to prove that this bookkeeping error or whatever you want to call it, where these payments to Stormy Daniels were marked as legal expenses as opposed to campaign expenses, they also have to prove that that was done in service of covering up another crime. And they, they don't have to prove the other crime, but they do have to get the jury to believe that this was done to cover up whatever that was. And they haven't even landed on a single crime that Trump was supposedly trying to cover up. They've suggested covering up a campaign finance violation. They've suggested that it was to interfere with an election by basically preventing damaging info from coming out about his campaign, which is why they're bringing in all of this evidence about the catch and kill schemes with the media. So, I mean, Michael Cohen's testimony, I guess, is trying to prove that aspect of it more than the fact that they falsified the business records, which we already know that they were marked legal as opposed to campaign. I mean, that's well established. But Michael Cohen being held up as this sort of perfect witness. Yes, he had a lot of access to the former president. He was his lawyer. But as you pointed out, he has a history of being someone that is very untrustworthy. Yeah, I, I think it shows that as long as you turn on Trump, uh, rehabilitation is always possible for you in the mainstream media's eyes because that is all they care about. And and so then they were talking about his Lawrence O'Donnell there, his how forthright he was. We, you know, we've not seen this side of him. What what side? Wh Right. What side is are there this? are there dimensions <laughs> to this man? Is this an overly complicated figure? This admitted former uh, fixer and kind of corrupt person who served um, Donald Trump. You know, in terms of the case itself, do I, I don't think this case uh, is is going to impact the election all that much. There's no statistical evidence whatsoever that people are tuning into it and changing their mind about Donald Trump. Um, I think he very well could be um, could be convicted. The jury could decide this is in fact a campaign finance um, violation and that it was marked this way, not just to shield, I guess, embarrassment from Melania, or, but but actually to, to shield it from the public. Now, whether that actually does violate the campaign finance statute, I, I can't tell, and we'll have to see what the jury says. So much of this seems designed to me to em embarrass Trump for, you know, going through the actual details of, of the alleged affair, which frankly don't even matter from the legal standpoint of the case, because it's whether or not that happened, it's whether the payment was made. So a anyway, um, I, I, think, uh, I think it doesn't really matter for the standpoint of the campaign, and that's the, the big thing. But the media coverage is very like, why don't you care more about this? Why aren't you paying attention to this? Why don't you see what we see? And uh, I, I like the reality check there from uh, CNN's legal analyst, who's been increasingly been very... Uh, very sober, as we described it, uh, compared to the rest of the team. Yeah, one of the few. And um, I think 
you know, there's a few things here. The first is that you brought up the sort of lurid testimony of Stormy Daniels, which might be very problematic for the prosecution because some legal experts have suggested this could open up the case for an appeal because she repeatedly suggested during her testimony that her sex with Trump was not consensual mm -hmm. by saying that she had blacked out in the middle of it, which obviously is a form of character defamation that has nothing to do with really the facts of the case and what they're actually prosecuting Trump for. So um, that could be troublesome for the prosecution. And then Michael Cohen, I mean, specifically, just so people know, he pleaded guilty to lying to Congress while he was um, being prosecuted for his tax evasion. Um, he pleaded guilty to that as well. But then when he testified during the Trump civil trial in New York over the supposed inflation of his real estate assets, he said on the stand that he, even though he pleaded guilty to tax evasion, he didn't actually do it, which is also yeah. lying. Well, like, you yeah. can't plead guilty to a crime well, sometimes, and then say, but I didn't really mean it. I was just doing it because well, of this. Well, you kind of can, right? Sometimes people plead guilty to th because they think they're going to get a lesser sentence, right? To get a Right, but you, can't, but you can't publicly say, I didn't do it once oh, you plead guilty right. legally. I mean, unless you take an Alford plea, right? right. So, I mean, that's so that's the, the difference. And, and the judge acknowledged that he was, whatever he did during that trial, whatever he testified to was unethical, but still allowed him to testify here, I guess, just because he's so close to the fact of the case. But you're right to say, you know, the entire media coverage of this is very much why don't the voters care enough? And even people who are very skeptical of Trump, like Chris Sununu in New Hampshire, have said that if he is a convicted felon, they will still vote for him. <laughs> and, and so it's like, if you can't even get the Sununus of the world, like this is clearly not your golden goose. One, um, one other element of this I wanted to bring up, and it, it ju this just happened today, that one of the exhibits in, in the trial was these texts from our uh, messages from Michael Cohen to New York Times reporter Maggie Haberman, um, in which, who is, you know, she's she's closely followed Trump and has been described, she's thought by liberals to be way too uh, positive toward Trump. So this is another example. They saw this as the smoking gun because in this text messages, um, Michael Cohen says to her, go ahead and start your story. We're going to get comment which I guess to very amateur people sounded like something that's nefarious or sinister, but it's clearly just like the, a reporter saying, I'm gonna, you, know, you might say this to a source, I'm gonna do the story if you're gonna comment, and if you're not commenting, I don't have enough to do the story, so let me know. That was him saying, I am going to get you that comment. Like that's a very standard journalism practice, but the freak out on social media was insane from people saying, this, this proves it, this proves what we said about her all along. <laughs> Because uh, the New York Times has really been uh, coming under criticism lately from liberals for for not for being perceived um, as being not doing its part to help elect Joe Biden. I guess the New York Times editor gave that interview to Semaphore last week, where he said, where he was totally right. He said, "Look, voters clearly care about immigration, the economy. We're talking about those things. We're talking about threat to democracy sometimes, but we're not. I, you know, it's not our job. Sorry, Biden White House. It's not our job just to tell our readers why." They need to vote for you, um, which and then I saw the reaction from from many Democrats was, see, they're admitting they don't think that's their job, but that is their job. Yeah, the the New York Times shockingly has been on the receiving end of quite a bit of praise from me recently. <laughs> Not only for that, but I mean, even I think it was six months ago, the Biden campaign was bringing all of these media outlets to its campaign headquarters in Delaware, and Axios reported that the New York Times was the one meeting that didn't go well because the editors were very turned off by the Biden campaign, essentially telling them how they were supposed to cover Bidenomics and the economy writ large, and they obviously didn't like that because that's not their job to be a campaign mouthpiece. Pamela Paul, a columnist there, has written a bunch of great stuff on like the the debate over trans kids and, and cell phones and schools and all these really neat cultural issues. And the paper has pushed back against the very vocal pro-Palestinian activists within its ranks. They pushed back against the some of the low-level staffers coordinating with GLAAD to accuse the paper of transphobia a few months ago. So I think like maybe they're kind of starting to get it a little mm -hmm. bit that they've allowed all of these really woke left-wing activists activists into its newsroom and it's up to them to now be the adults in charge and say actually no you don't get to determine our editorial direction mm, incredible all right more free media right after this